you turn it on. So welcome to the Understanding and Responding to Substance Abuse in Our Community session by Dr. Charlie Schletter. This session will be recorded. So um, please ask, um, ask your questions through the chat box or um, unmute yourself and ask directly when appropriate. So glad to see all of you here today. Thank you, Charlie, for helping us today too. Right, excellent. Aloha Friday, everybody. Glad to see you all. I have some familiar faces I can see in the crowd. People I may not know, um, but I'm glad you're all here. And we have a pretty small group, which means we certainly could go off on some tangents. Um, I don't want to make this a session about trying to help a specific person, but in general, we can talk about um, some of the issues you might have come across um, as a teacher, as a staff member, or just in your community in general. This particular set of slides is really there to consider yourself a community member. So it could be a neighbor, could be a friend, could be a, a child, you know, an adult child or um, a teenager that you're thinking about. Um, whatever the case, these slides should help um, us kind of uh, format the way we're gonna discuss this. And so I'm hoping um, as we move along that we can cover some of these important topics. Um, we're gonna look at what substance abuse is um, how many people in our communities tend to have this issue? Uh, what are some of the risk and protective factors involved in that? So how can we both see where people are more likely to get a substance use problem or um, protect themselves from that? Some of the warning signs you can look for and then how to get help and how we can be, um, you know, I'm gonna give you a little example of how you can actually approach somebody who might um, be struggling with substance use. So again, you know, we can do a Q&A at the end as well, but certainly um, if you want to use the chat box or just press your space bar, it'll unmute you and you can speak um, at will. Just hold your space bar down and I'm happy to have everybody um, be a part of the discussion. All right. Any questions for me as we start? All right. Um, just a quick little background. You know, I've been in the mental health field for I don't know how many years now, 20 something. I have to quit counting, but uh, long enough to see a lot of substance use issues. Uh, it didn't require me to be in a residential treatment program, but I certainly have worked in community-based facilities that do provide substance use treatment. Uh, but I would say anybody that works in this field has, has seen, um, clinically seen substance use and the problems that occur around it. But certainly each one of you individually um, I would have a hard time believing that you haven't known somebody, if not yourself, struggle with a substance use issue. So um, this also, you can use your own um, experience and, and wisdom to take this information and try to fit it in what you already know, okay? All right, so we have to start out with what, what do we mean by um, substances or um, substance abuse? We have to look at the actual substances we consider problematic. And any, anything you can put in your body that impacts your brain and its functioning would be considered a psychoactive substance. That's what we use, the term we tend to use. The biggest one being alcohol, the most prevalent as you'll see, and the most accessible and the most widely used in our community. Um, second to that would be cannabis or marijuana, um, more and more considered a um, quote unquote um, recreational drug in our society. And I think that that trend is not going to stop. I think we're going to continue to see marijuana look um, accessible um, along the same lines as, as alcohol. Okay. And then we have lots of other ones, tobacco being the third, actually tobacco being really the first in line for um, some of the problems that occur around the use of, its, um, of that product. But certainly tobacco, we consider um, uh, an issue, an addiction, and we, we treat that as well. So next in line, heroin and all the synthetic opioids. These are, you know, not just, you know, shooting up heroin in the street, but taking Oxycontin or some other painkiller that's an opioid um, in ways that are not really for the intended purpose. And we're going to talk about how that kind of goes from um, per the adequate use or the correct use of a substance into actual abuse. Amphetamines, um, this is also a really unfortunately a really popular um, drug class here in, um, in Hawaii, methamphetamine being one of those substances. Um, these are stimulants that um, usually wake the, the body up. Cocaine, 
sedatives and tranquilizers are not as common now nowadays, but they're still around. Um, ecstasy or um, MDMA is also another substance that's kind of re-emerging in our society, especially with younger people. Um, it was around when I was in high school and then it kind of had a, a quieting downtime and it's back, it's, it's getting, it's coming back with a vengeance. Hallucinogens, mushrooms, um, acid, those kinds of um, drugs are also considered, um, you know, part of a category sometimes of illicit drugs, but certainly um, hallucinogens have been getting a lot of uh, attention lately as a possible treatment. I don't know if you guys have heard about this, but there's been some more recent studies about using hallucinogens, um, uh, mescaline and um, some of the psilocybin um, mushrooms to actually address depression and other mood disorders. So interesting. So you'll see many of these substances, the history of these substances have had some purpose in our medical community, our treatment community and at some point fell out of favor because of the addictive qualities of those. Um, bath salts, this is another kind of crazy substance that we've seen in our community um, come and go. These are, you know, um, you know, these are humanly developed cocktails that people use to get high and are extremely corrosive and problematic for the body. Um, you, know, you might have heard of uh, spice is another one of those kind of that fits in this category. These are, you know, um, artificial substances that people have created, um, usually, you know, produced in, you know, countries like China, for example, and then sold in some fashion, um, you know, over the counter in ways that kind of elude the DEA for a period of time before they pull them off the shelf. So that's, bath salts is one of those. And then inhalants, this is a common, um, you know, sniffing glue, gasoline, paint, these are all another, again, commonly um, available substances that you can get, you know, in your, in, at Home Depot, for example. And um, these come in and out of favor, especially with young people, very young people. Any others? Can anybody else name a, a psychoactive substance that you've heard of that is kind of in our, um, in our ecosystem that people are using to get high? No? Did I cover them all? Wow. There's always some new one that I haven't heard of. Um, and there will always be new and, well, for some people, an exciting new drug to try um, that we will be artificially creating in our labs. Um, but we've pretty much found all the natural ones. So what you'll probably find is people trying to um, create artificially drugs that somehow mirror the effects that some of the natural drugs like, you know, alcohol, marijuana, um, even amphetamines come from a naturally occurring substance. That's where the formulas come from. But we'll, we'll be seeing those continue to be created in our society. I'll tell you about the one I'm, I'm thinking about. And that is, um, uh, that is, uh, I'm gonna see if you can guess it, the newest public health crisis. Um, almost 3000 hospitalizations in 2019 with 68 fatalities reported from the use of this particular drug. Um, most commonly used in the young community. Um, do you know which drug I'm talking about? You want to take a guess? That's the vape. What's that? Vape. Vaping. vaping. Very good. Wow. Nice, Melana. Yes, vaping. Um, this one is that was 2019 stats. I bet 2020 stats are through the roof at this point. Um, we still don't have a lot of um, you know regulation around this particular drug. Um, obviously, or this particular um, method of using nicotine primarily, but kids are using uh, vaping devices to consume nicotine, um, cannabis, and we're even finding them trying to, to, to actually use this to, um, to ingest other drugs. So it's kind of a scary situation that I'm concerned about, certainly, um, and it's, it's a primarily a young person um, phenomenon, you know, kids as early as 10 or 11 years old are getting access to and using vapes. So um, we'll have to keep an eye on that one, but that's another area that uh, we're looking at as far as um, you know, methods for, for using substances that are addictive. All right, so what is the difference between substance use and substance abuse? Well, there's a continuum, right? Um, how many around here drink wine or beer? 
you can raise your hand. You can, you know, right? Just Mary. Mary's the only one. That, okay. Thank you, Kelly. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. Thank you, guys. Right. So most of us in this room, I bet at least half of us, um, regularly, even if it's only um, occasionally, you know, once a week or once every couple of weeks or just socially, um, consume alcohol, right? So if you think of a continuum from people that don't use it all, all the way to people who are, you know, 15 years into a very severe um, alcoholism, there's a continuum of use. And so it, it's actually pretty challenging, even as a, a counselor, to figure out at what point on that continuum, on that line between zero and extremely, you know, a quart of, uh, you know, hard alcohol a day, how do we decide at what point that kind of flips the switch and somebody has an actual disorder? Well, let's look at that. One of the things we look at is tolerance. Tolerance is the buildup of um, your, your brain and your body's ability to take on a substance and have it have less effect. Your, your brain and your body actually do this purposefully. So the more you use a psychoactive drug, the more your body will you know, kind of get used to it and have it affect it less. So somebody who's a, an alcoholic could drink a quart of alcohol in a day and not get alcohol poisoning, um, maybe probably not throw up, um, and certainly wouldn't pass out, right? Whereas somebody that's really new to drinking, if they drink that much, they could actually easily you know, go into a coma, right? So tolerance is, is one of the markers we look for. Um, and it's just a natural process your body goes through. Related to that, um, the dependent side is, is this idea that you, your body craves and desires that drug. And so if you think of tolerance, tolerance is your body getting used to a drug. And the minute your body gets used to the drug, it, in, in a sense, it gets used to having it in its system. And the minute you start pulling back from that, your body starts to feel that through signs of withdrawal typically, right? And so we look for tolerance and dependence and that's specific to withdrawal. But what we're finding out over the years is that those two areas, um, those two um, signs that we look for are really not as powerful as the, the actual reinforcement of the drug. So what is reinforcement? I think of reinforcement the same way I think of um, the way we um, condition our, our kids or our dogs or whoever we're trying to train, how to, how to do something that we want them to do, right? So if you want your child to eat all the vegetables on their plate at the, for dinner time, then you'll, you'll, ask, you'll let them know that they could have dessert at the end, right? So that's a reinforcement. Anything that comes after a behavior that is either positive or negative could reinforce that behavior to occur or not occur. So we can either reinforce positively um, through some, something that somebody enjoys or negatively through punishment, right? So reinforcement as a driver of addiction is really the feeling people get after they use a drug, right? So no duh, anybody that's ever um, been involved in, you know, whether it's drinking alcohol, smoking pot or any other drug, um, once they've experience that effect, what, it, what effect it has on their brain and their body. And if they like it, then that could be considered a positive reinforcement for them, right? As we're going to see, drugs, you know, drugs and drug classes have different effects or they feel different for each individual. So what may be considered a positive reinforcement for one person, you know, smoking marijuana, for example, may not be reinforcing to another person. They may not enjoy it, right? So Reinforcement as a, as a driver of addiction, we found in, we're finding in more and more in the studies of addiction, that that is actually the primary driver. That is the main reason why people um, both seek out use and then become addicted, right? Which is a big difference from what we used to think, where we used to think at some point, the drug just takes over your body and you have no conscious ability to do anything about it, right? So now we're realizing actually it's more the feeling people get. The other really important signal that you can look for is failed attempts to quit. So somebody that has had a problem, they recognize the problem, they try to do something about it, but they're unable to. So failed attempts could be people trying to quit and then going back to it, right? 
but more most important for figuring out that difference between you know abstinence and full on addiction where does it where does substance abuse actually occur is really around the impact that drug drug use has on their life so you really look for impacts on somebody's school or work their home life their uh, intimate or friendship relationships legal issues and health concerns those are the main areas of their life that will ultimately be impacted if they have a substance abuse problem right so as a as a provider you know i don't just look at how much somebody uses i try to look at how does that use impact their life is it making their relationship with their partner problematic are they not showing up for work because they're hung over right um and are they having legal problems that's a typical reason why people enter these substance abuse treatment programs is because they get into trouble legally right driving while intoxicated um or you know theft because they're trying to seek out drugs right there are some other um pieces that we look for as substance use counselors but i think this is a really good list for you um, as a community member to understand to try to figure out like you know is is this really considered a problem or not right and if you look at the continuum again and you think about um full-on like addiction where we, we look at like a diagnosis and getting treatment in, a, in an actual treatment program there's more and more interest in our community especially our scientific community to start to understand problem users these are people that are just below the addictive phase, right? So maybe they have some of these um, markers like tolerance. Maybe they, they do, they can drink a lot, for example, um, but they're not having some significant work or school problems. They're, they do fine there. They're very functional. Um, you know, their, their partner may say it's, it's a problem, but it's, it's not such a problem that I would leave them for, or that it would make it difficult for me to stay with them. I can handle that, right? So it's as if though, it's a kind of lingering issue in their life, but it's not triggering the full blown diagnosis. And problem drinkers um, are becoming more and more interest in the scientific community because we're realizing that those people tend to hang in that category for maybe two or three or five or 10 years before they flip into a full on alcoholic, for example, right? So if we could figure out how to, um, how to identify and support people who are, um, you know, in a sense, kind of developing this issue or having it kind of in, in the background of their life, then we can maybe help them before they even um, tip over into a, a full blown um, diagnosis. Any questions about that one? That's an important concept because I think a lot of people think that if somebody, for example, this is the hardest one to think about, but if somebody is using methamphetamines, right? If, if they're using methamphetamines, then they're an addict. And that's not true. It's not clinically true. And it's not true from the standpoint of how that drug impacts their body, right? This is probably easier to see in drugs like hallucinogens, for example, right? Um, we know that hallucinogens have been used in um, indigenous societies for eons, right? That was where hallucinogens were discovered. They have a very spiritual um, um, component to their, you know, their culture and there are ways to use psychoactive drugs in ways that are not considered abuse. Now, do I ever encourage anybody to use methamphetamines um, in their daily life? No, of course not. Um, but we do have to understand that there are people out there that are using that are not necessarily um, addicted. And let's look at some of the statistics around that here. I think it's the next slide. So if you look at all the people in our society that have used um, some kind of psychoactive drug. Now this includes alcohol, includes tobacco, and includes marijuana. So you can see that, that the bulk of people in this survey are going to be somewhere around those three substances. But there's still a fairly large portion of people using other illicit drugs that are a lot more serious in our minds. So you can see that the, the pie chart here shows in the brown, the light brown, those are all the people in our community that that are, you know, that in the last 30 days have used some kind of psychoactive substance on that list we showed. And those are the people who are, just like we talked about, using but not considered under the category of abuse, right? So that's a lot of people, isn't it? 
that's the vast majority of people out there can drink alcohol, smoke marijuana, or, um, you know, I don't know how you put tobacco in there because tobacco is ultimately a killer, right? But certainly those particular substances are, you know, um, usable in ways that don't necessarily put them in the high risk category of addiction. But of those people, you know, the 7.8% people that are actually um, showing signs of a true addiction, you can see the vast majority of those are alcoholics, right? And we know that's true because of things like access to um, societal acceptance of drugs, right? So if you look down these, these drug classes, you can see somewhat how that kind of represents access, right? The easier it is to access a drug, the more likely it is to be used. And the more it is to be used, the more likely you're, they're gonna have abuse in our community, right? Okay. So still a lot of people, even if you take um, the, the, the folks that are actually addicted, 20 million people in America at any given time um, in a 30 day period would, would have um, enough behavior and enough signs to diagnose them with a, a substance use disorder. I like to show this slide because this is a really important one to understand how, you know, the etiology of addiction. So how does addiction um, first kind of appear? And as you can see, addiction is a developmental disease, if you want to think of it that way. Most people that become addicted to a drug or, you know, um, ultimately have problems, drug, drug and alcohol problems, started in their teenage years, right? So this does support the model that um, drug addiction is a medical condition, right? Uh, um, a disease. Because we do understand, remember the whole reinforcement thing I was mentioning, right? Reinforcement is something that your brain develops um, pathways to. So you can take any of the behaviors you have today as an adult, and you can trace many of your habits, <laughs> good and bad, back to your childhood, right? Um, if you're a sweet tooth, you're likely to have been exposed to sweet um, foods when you were younger. And that pathway, you know, sweet foods are have a euphoric effect on your body. And so your brain creates that pathway so that when you, you know, when you think about the desire or the need to feel good, you might go grab for um, a pint of ice cream, right? And that's all part of just the typical way your brain organizes. And so drugs are no different. You know, if you are exposed to and use drugs in your early years and you find drugs that reinforce you, make you feel good, then your, your brain creates those stronger pathways for that, right? Same is true for, you know, eating healthy foods. If, you're, if your mom and dad made you eat salad when you were a kid and you got used to it and you finally found ways to enjoy salad, you're more likely to eat salad as an adult, right? That doesn't mean, though, that, that we're all doomed. It just means that the risk factors are much higher for people who have been exposed to and have used alcohol or drugs. You can see the next um, highest category are 18 to 25 year olds. So some people may not try drugs or alcohol until they get into college. This is also very common, right? Especially if you've been raised in a family that was very strict and um, was able to keep you off of, um, out of and away from drugs and alcohol that you could still be exposed to and develop the cravings and all the, uh, the pathways in your early adulthood, right? Your brain, by the way, continues to develop across your entire lifespan. You can create pathways at any point in your life, right? But we do know that it, it tends to be stronger and you're, you tend to create more pathways in your early stages of life, right? And I think the other thing that I really try to teach parents is to understand that, you know, if you think of, as we'll see, um, you know, you know, reinforcement of drugs as a way to cope with problems, right? If you, you know, if you find a drug that makes you feel good when you're, when you're down, then the other, the opposite end of that is if as parents, we can find ways to give kids tools to help them manage their stress, um, deal with mood um, and problems in their life, then they're less likely to use that particular solution, right? The, the solution of drugs and alcohol. They're more likely to reach for those tools that they learned as kids, right? Those pathways, if you want to think of them that way. 
All right, so addiction is a developmental disease. Oh, by the way, this is, uh, these are statistics for marijuana's first use. Um, I think this is, um, let me see my slide. This is, uh, this is data from 2014. So it's a little old, but it's still probably pretty, really pretty relevant. Arlie, could uh, you share some specific examples of the tools um, that are recommended for, for teens and young adults? For, for dealing with stress. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you, you, know, you could easily go on the internet and search lots of ways that you could teach young people um, or older people yourself how to deal with stress. But, you know, certainly some of the more important things are, you know, making sure that you have good sleep hygiene, right? That you eat, that you take care of your body, that you exercise. You know, most of these things are what we think about in general, just a healthy lifestyle, right? Um, if you're, if you're physically fit, if you're um, energized and you're, you have um, the right amount of sleep, you're much more likely to deal with stress and be able to take care of business, right? But certainly other things we're learning that we can teach young people how to do, everything from, you know, meditation um, to just basic simple ways of um, being aware of your thoughts and your feelings, you know, being aware of your emotional state and learning how to, um, you know, express that to people so that you're not holding it in, right? We're going to look at also um, one of the common connections between substance use is substance use and mental health. So being mentally healthy is also a really critical part of dealing with um, stress um, and keeping yourself out of substance use. Well, look, Kelly, I'll, I'll show you also the, the protective factors, and that will also give you some indication of how we can, as communities, support young people um, when they're, you know, going through their developmental stage. What are the what are the factors that keep young people from um, diving into this as a as a solution? And I think that will help you as well. Okay, thanks for the question. All right, this is also another way to support the same um, information I've been giving you about, um, you know, substance use as a developmental issue. So this is age of first use, again, just like we looked at with marijuana, but this is for any kind of treatment admission. So this could be for cocaine or um, you know, alcohol, methamphetamine, whatever the case. And it shows you that of the people that are admitted into treatment, whether they're 50 or they're 20, um, their, their age of first use was, the earlier they used, the more high risk it becomes. So you can see, most, a lot more people um, that enter drug treatment are actually using in middle school. That's pretty crazy, isn't it? Um, many of you might not have realized that we have a pretty high number of kids nowadays that are engaging in whether it's cannabis use or methamphetamines or you know hallucinogens. Um, they're they're engaging in this behavior, alcohol, in this behavior much earlier nowadays than probably you know, 30, 40 years ago. Um, so 12 to 14 is, you know, 30% of people that seek treatment later in their life are gonna have used some kind of psychoactive substance much earlier. Look, there's even some under um, 11 years or younger, right? So this is one of the highest risk factors we see um, for problems later on. And if you think about the biology we just mentioned about the brain, you know, your brain is really sensitive early on in your life. And, you know, just like you can learn a language much easier as, as an eight-year-old or a 10-year-old, you're also more likely to learn and have a reinforcing brain for drugs the earlier you're exposed to them. So we know the longer we can keep young people off of drugs, the better, right? The more um, protective their brain is going to be. Okay. So let's look at some of the other risk factors involved. So... I like to look at risk factors from, this, from the standpoint of not just the individual, but their surroundings. What else around their environment can um, put them at risk? Um, the, the number one is just availability, right? Availability of drugs, um, any kind of drug class puts an adolescent at much higher risk. So, you know, one of the reasons why we know opioids has become such an explosion in our community is because it's in almost every family's drug cabinet, right? That we've had so many um, over the years, so many um, adults have been prescribed 
opioids, they don't use them and they're sitting in their drug cabinet. So whether it's their partner or their child, that that's one way that um, accessibility can start an addiction, right? Um, and when I say tolerance in a community, I mean not tolerance from the standpoint of what we mentioned earlier, it's, it's acceptability, right? So if, if a community becomes accepting of a drug, like alcohol, right? Everybody feels like alcohol is not a demon, right? Most people would believe that unless you've had a lot of experience with it. Um, most people think that alcohol is a socially acceptable thing to do, right? Um, marijuana is more and more becoming that in our, in our communities. So I would, I would expect that marijuana use is gonna to continue to rise as it has. And so the more we as a community accept that drug, the more likely um, young people and old people alike are gonna access that drug. Um, for, for anybody, whether it's you know, young people or people in, in college, friends that use is really the highest risk factor we can find. You know, if you do the research and, and survey kids and find out kind of their, their life situation, kids that tend to use, use because you know, when I say kids, I mean young adults too, tend to use because somebody around them introduced them to it, right? Um, it doesn't have to be the model of peer pressure either. The person doesn't have to pressure them into using, they can just invite them, right? Um, I think we used to think that we had to try to find a way to teach kids how to deal with, you know, peer pressure. But what we really know is that, um, you know, because of the, the, the first bullet here we have, that there's an, uh, you know, because part of our community might be accepting of the drug, kids are just looking for a way to access. And so if they're looking for a way to access and availability and the peers have it, then they're much more likely to use it, right? They're gonna have much more availability. Um, again, you know, learning from other people, this doesn't have to be just their peers, by the way. Um, parents that use put their kids at much higher risk because of availability and modeling, right, to see other people do it. So um, most kids or most young adults that use have used because they've been exposed to it in some way, whether it's in their family of origin or their peers or their you know, college community, for example. We also know that genetically, um, depending on your genetics, you could be at higher risk. So um, you know, if either one of your parents had an addiction um, or even your grandparents, or your aunts or uncles, um, any of those familial ties had an addiction, a history of addiction, that that raises your level of risk as well. So we're not really completely sure. You know, we haven't like found the genetic piece in our genetic code that, that specifically relates to that. It's probably several different um, parts of your genetic code. But we do know that it must have to do something with how those how that drug or drug class, specific drug class, um, you know, interacts with your brain, your, the chemistry of your brain, right? You know, one of the interesting things we know about, you know, like marijuana, for example, is you can line up a hundred people, right? And, and get them high for the first time, right? In various ages, doesn't matter what age. Um, and some people will, um, you know, a percentage of those people will tell you it was terrible and they'll never do it again right? They got paranoid. Um, they didn't like feeling out of control. And we know some of that might be from genetics because other people in that group will, will say they never got high at all. They couldn't feel the feeling at all. And then a, a group will say, this was wonderful. I would, I would try it again if I had it. So we don't know the, exactly the, the biology around that other than we know that it must have to do something with genetics and the way we metabolize and, and process that drug. So that has to do with sensitivity to the substance as well. Um, and then again, other mental health problems. And we're gonna look at that in just a second. So mental health and substance use um, do tend to kind of um, you know, overlay on each other. And I think for me, you know, in the work that I've done with people, I find the most common kind of characteristic that all people share that end up having an addiction problem is the lack of connection they have with other people, right? Kind of falling out of society in some way could be that they lose their job, 
and their job was a big part of their identity. Um, could be that they had family issues um, that has kind of ostracized them from their community or their family, right? Um, that, that, that connection is an important part of the human, um, the human condition. And if we don't have connection, then we ultimately tend to go look for some kind of other reinforcer, right? And then the other part to that, connect to that is just life purpose in general, finding satisfaction and some kind of fulfillment in your life. If you don't have that, then you're at much higher risk for using substances because substances can, especially the more um, um, you know, intense substances like heroin, for example, or opioids, um, can really kind of fill that void for a very short period of time. And then you're always trying to fill that void, right? You're always trying to find a way to create that feeling, that sense of, of enjoyment, right? And life purpose tends to, to, to provide that, that enjoyment in your life. So that's my, that's the one thing I look for when I look with people is where, you know, where do you fit in these two areas of your life, your social life, and just your sense of kind of where you fit in the world, your niche, right? Charlie, it seems to me that that's almost the most important thing that we can do, right, is to help our students try to find a connection and a sense of purpose yeah. for being here. Because if you're, an if you're an adolescent, your brain isn't fully formed. So all of these rational arguments about genetic predisposition and <laughs> peer influence and the right. negative aspects of starting young, like that's not going to really resonate because they're not perhaps even able to think rationally without a fully formed frontal lobe. <laughs> and right. so it yeah. seems like, yeah. like that is the best thing that, and just kind of getting back to Kelly's other question, right? That, that seems like the best way we can be useful is to help them find their sense of purpose and um, reason for being in connection. It's just interesting. Yeah, you know, I mean, I use, if, if you go back to this list, I do use some of these areas like genetic predisposition and sensitivity to the substance. I think these are actually really important parts of um, understanding substance use, only, not because you can do anything about it necessarily. If, you're, if your parents or your uncle were, um, were addicted to drugs, it's not as if though you can take that genetic code away through you know, sheer will, but it does mean that it helps the individual or a teacher or whoever is working with this person understand that that elevated risk so for me it's kind of like what if you know what if you knew that your your parent had high blood pressure right um you would probably if you were if you could take that information in and then know how to kind of protect yourself then you would know that it would be more important for you than other people to be careful about your diet and exercise and deal with your stress so in some ways that that's there really just to know um, as information that I want to, I want to be able to lower the potential risk factors, or at least be aware of those risk factors, so I can kind of layer on more protective factors. But you're right. I mean, as as I think as faculty or as people working with young people, one of the best ways we can kind of address or support students is to try to help them make connections in life, right? And so, obviously, as a, a you know, as a as an instructor, we have a lot of opportunity to put kids in situations where they can experience new ideas, um, maybe possible career options, get them stoked on something, right? And that's certainly something that I always think about when I'm working with students is how can I um, put something in front of them that can light, light up their imagination or get them interested in, in an area that they weren't before. Very good, thanks. Okay, so looking at the risk and protective factors. So risk factors are anything that add to the possibility of something happen. And then protective factors, as, as the word says, kind of can protect or shield somebody from a problem. So this little, um, you know, this little uh, chart here shows the peer versus in the family. How can we, or how can, the, how can friends um, and how can family either lower or higher the risk of substance use. Um, and as I mentioned before for peers, it's just having um, the highest risk factor is having somebody um, close to them that is using, right? But, you know, anything around, you know, um, you know, some of the other ways that we know that put kids at risk, whether individually or as a group, 
are some of the impulsivity that's, that's part of adolescence, right? Uh, makes a lot of sense, right? The more impulsive you are, the more likely you are to try a drug. And then once you try it, if it works for you, if it's reinforcing, then you've set yourself on that path, right? Um, and some of the obvious ones like antisocial um, kind of peers, you know, delinquent kind of peers often run in groups with substance use, right? Um, so those shouldn't be all that, uh, you know, surprising to you. Again, the other one is early onset. So the earlier a, a, a person uses a, a substance or tries psychoactive drugs specifically to get high, the higher risk, right? Um, and then protective factors, you know, certainly we know that all kinds of social groups, you know, just like antisocial groups, pro-social groups can be really impactful for kids. So whether it's a, you know, um, you know, a church group or, you know, it's some of these community centers that kids have access to that they can go to, um, sports, for example, anything that keeps a kid busy, we all know that really does help protect them from, you know, time where they could be exposed to and accessible to drugs, right? Okay. Um, and the one, the family area shouldn't be also, shouldn't be that surprising either, right? We know that families that have poor supervision is really the highest risk factor for kids from a family perspective. So parents that are not keeping up with their kids, they're not properly knowing where they're at or knowing who they're around. Um, parents actually, even when, even when kids reach adolescence and really start to maybe um, go on their own a little bit more, parents still can and should have a, a really powerful influence on their kids. So keeping really up to date with what's going on and you know, monitoring what kids are doing is an important um, you know, protective factor for kids, right? You know, obviously parents' own attitudes and behaviors around substances can either put the child at risk if, the, if parents use and are accepting of drugs or can be a protective factor if parents are really clear about their expectations um, and their own behavior around drugs and alcohol, right? Okay. And then lastly, I'll say the one thing that I found interesting about, you know, I've done a lot of family work um, in, you know, in relationship to drug abuse with, with teenagers is that when teenagers and their parents or young people and their parents have a good relationship, right? They're connected, they talk to each other, they're open in their relationship, they're able to you know, bring up whatever issues they have, that those particular individuals that have strong family ties attachment have a much lower risk of substance use, right? And if they do um, ultimately find themselves struggling with substance use, they're much more likely to reach out and have support, right? So that's where you really need to think of, you know, as a, not just as a parent, but as a neighbor or as an instructor, to the extent that you can create emotional um, attachment, connection to individuals, they're more likely to, um, you know, like we said, you know, find meaning in their life and be willing to reach out if they have a problem. Okay, any thoughts about that, anybody? Donna, did you have a question? No? Okay. All right. Um, so I, I wanted to mention substance use and mental health because it is incredibly connected. Um, it's actually more likely that somebody with a substance use disorder also at the same time, we call that co-occurring, also has a mental health issue, right? Most commonly, the most common mental health issues being depression and anxiety, right? I'm not gonna go into great detail about what those are, but most of you can figure out what depression is, right? And anxiety just based on those descriptors. Okay. So one of the ways that we find this, um, this happens is somebody ends up with um, struggling with a mental health issue, right? Um, anxiety is a good one, right? So somebody becomes anxious, worried, and you know, they start having physical signs. They may, um, they may have an um, upset stomach all the time. They may find themselves having difficulty falling asleep at night. And so they do something called self-medicate, 
we all have all heard about this, right? Um, instead of going and getting help for their issue with a mental health provider, they try to find ways to deal with their problem on their own. So somebody with anxiety might decide to drink alcohol, right? To, to calm themselves down. Um, or, you know, somebody with depression, um, also we're gonna talk about uses substances and we're gonna see how that impacts their, their mental health. But self-medication is a common way in which people may start with a mental health issue and then end up also with a substance use issue. So people with, um, well, like I said, mood or anxiety disorder are two to three times more likely to have a substance use disorder. That's pretty high, right? Right, so um, maybe 300 times, 300% uh, more likely. That's a, that's a really big number, right? Um, so sh and it doesn't surprise me, but I think for many people it is surprising. Um, so the other is true as well. So if you, if, you if you develop an addiction, you then become at much higher risk of developing a mental illness. So the chicken and the egg, um, it can go both ways, right? So I can start out with a mental health issue and become addicted to drugs because of that, or I can start off with an addiction and that can create mental illness, right? Um, and the double whammy effect, I like this one because a lot of people don't realize this, is that um, alcohol is a depressant. That means even though you may drink alcohol and you might feel good for a moment, right? You might even feel a little bit of euphoria, right? Um, that the ultimate impact depression or alcohol has over the course of its use is it depresses your, your brain activity. It slows your brain down and has the same impact that, that the mental health disorder depression has. And so it is not uncommon that people will be depressed and then drink to try to feel better. But what it really does is alcohol increases the severity of a mood disorder. So these are really common, um, you know, these are really uh, well-known facts that most people in our society don't realize, right? It's very common for me to work with somebody who's depressed, that comes into my office depressed. And if I ask them, are you currently drinking alcohol or using any other um, substance, right? Um, or any kind of, you know, prescription medication, alcohol is really the most common thing that people use when they're depressed, right? It's in all the, all the, country western songs that I've heard, right? <laughs> so it's a really common solution in our society, unfortunately, that, that really makes it worse. All right, some of the warning signs. Um, Carly, can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah, go ahead, Julie. About, that, um, about what you just shared. Yeah. I'm curious if some of the people that you might have serviced really understand um, the consequences of you know, using alcohol as a mask, I guess, to get them through that? Do they really understand the impacts of it creating further harm in the sense of mental illness and um, kind of perpetuating that kind of thought? Or is it like news to them? They just kind of in a habit. I'm just curious what your thoughts are behind that. Most people, and I think if you went around your society and asked what, al what um, effect alcohol has on your body, they're not going to say it's a depressant. They're just not, you know, I didn't, you know, until I studied drugs and alcohol and the effects they have, I didn't realize it because when I drink alcohol, I feel really good for a while, right? For that first, I don't know, hour or so, I'm on top of the world. But over the course of the night, I get tired, right? Um, and if I drink a lot of alcohol, I'll pass out. So you should figure that out, right? It should be obvious, but most people, because you know, of the interesting kind of, that's why alcohol has been around forever is because it has several effects on your body. It's not just a depressant. Initially, it actually, um, it actually invigorates your body. Your blood pressure goes up and some other, um, you know, you get a, you, the euphoric effect that you get with some other drugs. So no, at most people, Julie, when I tell them, you know, did you know alcohol is a depressant? They're like, what do you mean? It's like, did you know that you have depression and you're taking a drug that's a depression drug, meaning it's gonna make you more depressed. And they're like, no, I didn't know that. I was like, well, that's, you know, if you wanna stop being depressed, that would be your first step to take is to either cut down or stop your alcohol content. Yeah, yeah cool. thanks for sharing that. And I, yeah. I just feel like uh, to me, that's part of the education, right? It's like yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, same thing is true for um, like um, methamphetamine, right? People that are, um, that you see that are just, when they get on meth, they go crazy. Right. Most of those people are probably already anxious, um, you know, just naturally an anxious person. So their body is already wound up. And then when they do methamphetamines, it just takes them, you know, way over the top, right? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks for that. Thanks. So the double whammy effect. Like yeah. That. Okay. <laughs> All right, so warning signs. These are just a quick, we already kind of covered these in some ways, but let's just um, remind ourselves. Increased substance use over time. So if you or, you or somebody you know, you've noticed that that substance uh, may have been drinking more or smoking more, or you just, you just have a, um, a suspicion that they've been using more over time that's problematic. Um, and that's related to tolerance too, right? Not just using more often, but using more of the drug is also a, a warning sign that they're developing an issue, right? And difficulty controlling use. So this could be in the form of wanting to quit. Um, you know, you might, have, you might know somebody in your life or you might yourself have said, you know, I'm gonna stop doing this. I wanna stop eating poorly or I wanna stop whatever. You know, if, if you can't stop on your own, that is a true sign of something that's beyond your control at this moment, right? And most people think of addiction as a, a loose a, a loss of control, right? Symptoms of withdrawal. So people who um, use a drug regularly and then for a period of time don't have access, it could be that they've chosen not to have access or it could be that they're not able to find the drug for a period of time or they don't have the money for it. Will we'll actually, if they have that dependence cycle, will actually start to have withdrawal symptoms. So if you're interested if you find that you're scratching your head about some of the symptoms you're seeing, you can go on the internet anywhere and find different withdrawal symptoms for different kinds of drugs, right? So opioids have, have their own. So like, you know, um, not just heroin, but, you know, all the Oxycontin and all the prescription drugs have their own set of withdrawal symptoms. Um, alcohol has its own set of withdrawal symptoms as well. Um, and a quick question, how many people know what two drugs in our society you can die from if you try to quit cold turkey? Anybody know what those two drugs are that are most commonly you can die from the withdrawal symptoms? There's two of them that are really common that people can and, and do die from. One of them alcohol. is really common. Alcohol is one of them. Thank you, Shan. Yes, most people didn't realize that. Um, if, you, if you've been drinking that quart of alcohol, um, for even a couple of years every day and you have to wake up and drink, right? So feel okay. If you tried to, if you tried to quit, you could um, die of, you know, several different um, shocks in your body that could, you know, you could have a seizure, um, your heart could stop. There's lots of ways in which your body is unable to recover from that, right? So opioids is the other one. You can die from benzodiazepines, but it's very uncommon. Um, but there are ways to support somebody who wants to stop drinking if they have a, a really chronic, very severe issue through detox. That's what you've heard of the detox programs. That's what those are for. Preoccupation with the substance. This is another, um, this is a different way of talking about one of the signs we look for um, as substance use counselors is thinking about going about the business of getting and using and planning out my day based on getting high, right? And people that are chronic users, um, you know, chronic marijuana users do this, right? They spend their day thinking about when they're gonna get high, when they're gonna get their drugs, um, you know, when they're gonna get their pot. Um, and they think about and talk about it a lot. So people that are really preoccupied with substance use, um, it's, a, it's a regular daily part of their routine, right? Giving up important activities um, in to replace them with substance use. So somebody that used to uh, paddle, they used to surf, used to have um, social groups that they were a part of, and all of a sudden they start withdrawing from those groups. You know, with a college student, you know, all of a sudden just not turning in work, right, or going to class. These are certainly signs that they could be developing um, a substance use problem, right? And then continuing even after recognizing the problem. Um, 
there's something really interesting about substance use that's not like any other issue that I've seen, you know, even other behavioral like um, habits that is just different from, you know, people that have um, a weight problem or people that have, you know, some other kind of habit they're trying to kick usually feel okay about identifying it. Um, they just have a hard time dealing with it. But with substance use, there's a good subset of the population that has a problem and they just are not willing to or able to identify and recognize it. We call it denial, right? Um, and it's really, it's somewhat of a, um, of a unique part of the substance use problem. So we use this model, the stages of change model as, as providers. And I just wanna you know, show you this because I think it'll help you if you're working with somebody who's struggling with an addiction problem, because working with somebody who's struggling with an addiction problem can be very, um, geez, um, I think of a lot of feelings people express to me, but frustrating, right? Or knowing somebody that has an addiction problem, it's obvious, right? You know, you, t they can, you can check off all the boxes I mentioned about what um, defines a substance use problem, and yet the person in front of you continues to deny it, right? To say they don't have a problem. Well, what we found is um, the stages of change model really helps us understand that. And the first stage of the stages of change model is pre-contemplation. And that's where most people with an addiction problem start, which is, I don't have a problem at all. I don't know what you're talking about. You're crazy. Um, it's your problem, not mine, right? You'll get a lot of this pushback from people. And all of us go through this particular stage with any kind of habit we have, but with substance use, people tend to get stuck in this kind of denial stage for a much longer period of time, okay? And then the, the trick for counselors is to try to push them or help them, guide them through to what's called contemplation, where they haven't really decided they have a problem, but they're willing to look at it, right? And that's something that as a community person, you know, or a friend or whoever, you can try to help people that are, that are kind of in denial, try to figure out how their issues are impacting their life so that they can start to see, you know, oh, well, maybe even though I still want to get high, I see how maybe that behavior is affecting my life. And so that's what we do. Um, we train, you know, we, we try to help people learn how to recognize both sides of it so that they can move on into the action phases, right? Um, preparation and action. And that's where you see people making a choice to stop or to cut down and to try to, you know, change their behavior. Okay. So fact or myth, addiction is a disease that requires professional help. So you guys can use the chat box and you can decide whether it's a fact or this is a myth. Addiction is a disease that requires professional help. Use the chat box. Fact or myth? <laughs> Mary says, hmm, fact. All right. Well, I hate to bust your bubbles, but, you know, there is no, you, you could ask 100 professionals this question and you could find probably um, a split of some kind, right? My belief is that that is actually a myth. Now, I'm going to tell you why it's a myth. Um, because we know that addiction, most people, the majority of people, they remember that big pie we had, and then we had the smaller pie, right? We had like 20 million Americans, maybe seven and a half percent of the population is in that category of addiction. The majority of those people get clean and sober without any professional help at all. The majority. Some, pe some people believe it's somewhere in the 70% range of people that never go to professional counseling to get help. Now, that means that probably they found support and help and recognition of the problem through other means, right? Could be, could be somebody like yourself, right? Could be a counselor, could be, you know, like a school counselor, could be a, a friend or a coach or a teacher, right? Um, but the vast majority of people in our society become addicted and then figure out a way out, right? Then there's this other group of people that are addicted 
they can't figure it out on their own or with, with some kind of informal support and they need help. So this doesn't preclude the, the, the need for some kind of a treatment, you know, professional treatment program, right? Like residential treatment or outpatient treatment. It just means that there's a pretty significant portion of our population that, um, that's able to figure it out, right? There's a good um, article here in, in Scientific American, if you're interested in this topic, that you could read about. Um, but there's people that's, that have been um, writing about this for, for years and years and years because, you know, we talk about how few treatment um, programs there are relative to how many people we know in our communities are addicted. And how is it that we don't have more of a problem than we have? And that's probably because some people just decide to figure it out on their own. I've met people, I met a man um, a couple years ago that was a hardcore drinker for 25 years, right? And he came to me for another issue um, that he had, he'd been clean and sober at the time I met him for about five years. He's pretty, you know, pretty far along on his sobriety. And I asked him how he quit. And he said, you know what? I just woke up one day and said, I'm tired of this. I'm not doing it anymore. And he just stopped. I'm like, no, that's not possible, right? It's impossible just to wake up one morning and just stop. No, it is. And he said, yeah, I thought I was going to die. I, ne I didn't go to detox. Um, I was, I was a, you know, an early morning drinker and I, I just white knuckled it. I was like, wow, man, that is amazing. And those, those stories are all over the place. So don't be surprised if you meet somebody that said, you know, or, or if, you're, if you know somebody that all of a sudden after enough issues in their life and enough people encouraging them to quit that they don't need to go to treatment necessarily. So I would always give people the space that they need to figure out how to get well. But certainly there's a big portion of people in our community that can't do it alone. There's no doubt about that. I know people like that too, right? All right. So how do you approach somebody that um, might need help? I'm going to give you just a quick, um, easy, uh, kind of formula that I would use if I were in the community and I knew somebody, even if I was a, you know, as a counselor, as a community member, and I take myself out of the counselor role, this is how I'd approach somebody, a friend, um, a colleague, you know, a student, whatever that I was concerned with. You begin with a concrete statement. So you need to really think about what it is that has gotten you to the point where you're concerned and you need to be able to express that in very concrete terms. So here's an example of a student that's been missing class, right? Um, and then in class, when they do come, their behavior looks different, right? So to be able to really identify, you know, the missing attendance and having their head down in the classroom makes me concerned, right? And then, you know, let them know that you're concerned, right? Um, and this should be an empathetic, heartfelt um, statement that you can make to show that you're worried about them and that you want to help them, right? And then, and then an open-ended question to ask them, can you tell me what's going on? Help me understand where you're at, right? I'm interested, right? And the hardest part of that is then to do the last step, which is listen, right? Most of us feel like we have to actually start out with, hey, Jesse, I think you have a drinking problem, right? Or I think you're on drugs, right? And that is the kind of knee-jerk reaction we all have because we've come to the conclusion that this person has a problem. And guess what? You probably right. I mean, especially if you know who they're hanging around. Um, if it's somebody that's you're more familiar with, you might know a lot about their situation. But you know, calling it for what it is is probably not the best place to start. It may be somewhere you go eventually with them, but the first place to start really is just to let them know that you're concerned and you want to know what's going on, right? You you're interested and you want to see how you can help them, right? So that's a real simple formula. It's something you should be able to use with, you know, somebody very close to you or somebody that you just have an acquaintance with that you're concerned about. Any questions on this one? Pretty self-explanatory, right? Just stay out of the, hey, I think you're addicted and I think you need to go check into a law house for some residential treatment. Guess where that's going to go? <laughs> it's not going to go very far, I can tell you right now. Um, yeah. So there are some resources in our community to get help. Um, there's the professional treatment model, which I encourage. I, I don't, you know, just because I know that a lot of people get help outside of the treatment community 
I still believe very um, deeply in the fact that we need treatment in our community and we need to steer people in that direction. Um, there's residential treatment. Those are the, those are the programs that um, provide a, a place for that person to stay physically 24 seven until they get clean and sober. Um, the, the biggest program here um, on Maui is Aloha House. It's up in um, up country in Makawa. Um, and you know, people can stay in a residential program for typically nowadays, it's like 30 days. I know it used to be 90 days before that was six months, but you know, with the, uh, you know, with the advent of managed care and the, you know, the amount of dollars we spend on, on treatment now, it's a much shorter period of time, but 30 days is still enough to detox the body completely of a drug and give somebody a good shot at then going into what we call outpatient treatment, which is the typical counseling model that you think about where you, you go home, you, you, you know, you might even go to work, but for periods of the, of the week, you're engaged in group therapy, um, individual counseling and other programs to help you kind of stay on track. Um, and you can access treatment. Um, the best way to probably do that nowadays because the Aloha House is the biggest program is just to Google Aloha House. They have an intake number and that you can encourage that person to call. They have to set up an appointment. They actually have to do an assessment to make sure that they have a, a, a problem and then how much of a problem they have because not everybody needs residential treatment, right? Just like some people can quit on their own, some people don't need to go and live in a, in a place to get clean and sober. They just need enough support to, and the tools that they need to, to help them make goals and stay on, stay on track. So um, a lot of people actually do really well in outpatient treatment, especially if they're really motivated. There's the self-help groups, right? Maybe you maybe know these like Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous. Um, these have been really helpful for a lot of people over the course of you know, our history. Um, some people swear by it. They stay in the AA groups for years and years and years. Some people never stop being a part of their Alcoholics Anonymous um, groups. And there are lots of meetings all over town. So, um, you know, my, my belief about this is that there are definitely people that really benefit from this, from this model. But then there are people that just don't. And they really, you don't want to push them into um, a kind of um, community that they don't feel comfortable with. So I would encourage you to realize that AA is not, again, just like professional treatment is not um, a given. Um, AA is not a requirement for people to clean sober, but it's a really helpful model for many people. I want to mention medically assisted treatment because this is one of the newer um, models that has taken a lot of flack in our community. Um, both our substance abuse community and our medical community. Medically assisted treatment are drugs that you prescribe people that help to address things like cravings, right? Um, and, you know, one of the more, more um, one of the old uses of um, medications is methadone. You guys have heard of methadone before, right? Methadone is, um, is an opioid, um, um, a chemically created um, kind of milder opioid class that gives patients just enough of that drug to curb their um, instincts to want to try um, opioids and use opioids. It masks the actual opioid effect if you do try to take opioids. And it's been used for, for a long time. Uh, methadone has been used for a long time for, for people trying to cut their heroin um, addiction. But there are much more sophisticated drugs out there now. And I think we're going to find over the next, you know, couple, three or four decades, that medically assisted treatment is going to be one of the primary ways that we help people that are unable to help themselves, that are unable to kick the habit um, on their own willpower and their own support system, because we're getting much more sophisticated in being able to, it's kind of like a, like a vaccine, right? It's, it's the ability to give somebody in their body a chance to um, take a piece of that that reinforcement and then kind of turn it on its side so that it's not so impactful, right? Not so significant, right? So methadone's example. It's very controversial. Again, people in the substance use community, especially old timers are really against the idea of taking a drug to try to stay off of a drug. But, you know, I'm pretty open to it. I've, uh, I've worked with people that have been on some of these um, more 
uh, contemporary um, medically assisted treatment drugs, and they've done really well. You know, people that have been on heroin for years and years and years, methadone didn't work, but some of these other drugs have. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm open to it. And then informal supports. This is an area that I think is really underrated. Informal supports are any, any person, any program, um, any institution in our community that's not necessarily considered drug treatment, but it supports some of the areas that this particular person needs to stay off drugs and alcohol. So we mentioned teachers, coaches, um, you know, uh, religious institutions, churches. Uh, these are all examples of informal support, friends, right, mm -hmm. colleagues. These oftentimes build the support system needed, not only for people to stop, um, but to maintain their sobriety. So even if you go to a residential facility for 30, 40 days, you still gotta come back home, right? You still gotta go back in your community. And so informal supports are a big part of um, getting and staying clean and sober. And then I mentioned ARIS here, just because if you're working with a student here on campus and you're concerned about their behavior and you're not sure, right? Um, you know, I think that's more the common experience I have when I'm working with a student is I may suspect substance abuse, but I don't know for sure. I know that they, they have some of the signs and symptoms of it, but if I were concerned about a student and I wanted um, a, what we call a wellness check, I can call Eris up or send him an email and say, hey, Eris, I got this student in my class. They're acting different, right? Or they're acting abnormal relative to what I think is considered, you know, typical. Um, can, can you visit this person and, you know, do a quick check up on them and just to see how they're doing. It could be that they have something very different happening in their life other than substance use, right? Um, you know, extreme life events, tra trauma, um, a, a budding mental health disorder can also show, create some of the signs and symptoms we've talked about. So don't jump to the assumption that they're using substances, but if they're having some of these signs and symptoms, they need some help anyway. So Eris, um, there's also Mari, She's also another pers uh, personal support counselor and you can, you can reach her too. Um, just um, email Eris and he'll help you connect with her. Carly, I have a question. Yeah. Um, my question is, does methadone help like wean people off of opioids so they can like kind of just wean themselves through good these? Question. Yeah, good question. I do know people that have taken methadone for a period of time and then stopped. Um, but lots of people continue taking methadone for a much longer period of time. So, you know, I'm not an expert on that, but I, I've, I've seen both. I've seen people come, go off of methadone, but I've also seen people stay on for long term. Um, you know, um, I think sometimes this is where the medically assisted treatment does need some more um, research and, and some more, you know, we need to figure out better how to use it because you kind of don't want to have somebody continuing to take prescription drug for long periods of time, 10, 20, 30 years. But I do know there's people out there, you don't, it's not um, out of the ordinary for somebody to still be on methadone, you know, two decades later. Yeah. Good question. All right. Others, any questions? I'm, I'm done with my side. Does anybody else have any other questions? What's the best way to express concern without coming off as judgmental if the person kind of already feels attacked? Yeah. Yeah, that's the hard part. I mean, that's the sensitive part. I mean, so, you know, even if you use the formula I mentioned, that person might become defensive, right? I don't have a problem. I don't know what you're talking about. You know, um, I missed class because of X or, um, you know, I was tired that day, right? Um, you, you aren't gonna break through somebody who, is, who is, has their guard up like that. But what you can do is just say, well, I'm here for you. I'm thinking about you, right? Um, you know, if you ever wanna talk about anything, let me know, that kind of stuff, right? So, you know, most of, you know, if you look at the informal support side and those people that did quit, right? Um, they went through that whole process of denial themselves. And it's a process people, it's their journey they go through. So, you know, if it's your, if it's your teenager or if it's, you know, a friend of yours or, um, you know, if it's a student at school, your job is just to continue to stay connected to that person and continue to reach out as you see opportunities to do so, right? But you don't want to, every time you see them, say, I'm still, I'm still worried about you, right? You want to, you want to have a relationship outside of that conversation too. 
Right, good question. Also, um, wanted to get your um, thoughts, Charlie, on the term. I hear people using more now um, drug misuse instead of yeah. abuse. Yeah. Yeah. And you think of the problem drinker is a good, um, is a really good, it's, it's, it's the kind of the old school term for that, the problem drinker. Um, and it's getting more and more attention. But problem drinking, especially in the younger population, binge drinking, for example, right? You can drink till you pass out. And that's misuse, but it doesn't necessarily categorize as addiction because it isn't, hasn't taken a place over a, a period of time. And you're not, you know, you don't have built the tolerance built up and all that. But yeah, misuse, um, misuse can also be, for example, somebody, even somebody who's been prescribed opioids, right? So maybe I had, um, let's say I had a surgery, right? And they gave me 20 Oxycontins, which by the way, you do not need 20 Oxycontins to recover from surgery, Jesus Christ. Um, so I have, I, you know, I took three or four of them, right? Um, the first day, the second day, I didn't really need them, but man, shit, that felt good. And so the minute I put that pill on my mouth, because I like the taste, I like the way it felt, is misuse, right? I don't really need it for pain anymore. And that's what the cycle of opioid abuse has really taken off because of the misprescribing of medications that initially um, creates that early stage of addiction. Opioids can, I don't know, Mary, you might be able to say more about this, but I know that um, they say you can, you can start to build an addiction to opioids in just a couple of weeks, right? Um, I would honestly say that it's it's quicker. Um, yeah. And something that um, I like to teach my students um, when they're telling people about taking their pain medications postoperatively is exactly what you just stated, that when you're not having pain anymore, just <laughs> stop taking the medication. Now, here's the thing. I mean, even after a few days of taking, uh, let's say, two to four uh, or I'm sorry, one to two Vicodin every four to six hours around the clock. Say you do that three or four days. On day five, if you don't take any Vicodin, no, you're going to be pretty uncomfortable. Yeah. You're going to feel kind of uncomfortable from, you know, not having it in your system. And so, um, you know, it, it's unfortunate that we don't talk more openly about that, that yeah. the person who takes, you know, that that much Vicodin over a four day period acutely um, mm. should understand that, that that it would be normal to feel uncomfortable on day five when you're not taking anything because your body's really gotten used to that. Right. Um, and so, you know, but, but we don't really talk openly and we wouldn't necessarily say, well, you kind of maybe want to wean yourself down a little bit. Maybe you just want to take one Vicodin every four to six hours, you know, it, it, it just gets really complicated. But um, truth be told, uh, some of the addiction occurs just because of how uncomfortable it is to just come off of them, even taking them as prescribed. That's a great point. I didn't think about just a couple of days, but it probably is true. Yeah. I mean, these opioids are super powerful and they have a really direct line to, to that part of your brain. Right. Yeah. 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 Very serious. So thanks. Thanks for sharing that, Mary. Awesome. Okay. Others, questions. We have a couple more minutes. So if you have questions, fire away. Well, you know, I, I just think in general, you know, we all have a part to play in our community, right? Um, the more information we know, the better we can educate people, right? About um, what we see and our, the, not just the concerns we have, but what we know about, you know, um, how drug and alcohol um, addiction is developed. I think it's just really a, a, a great set of information for us all to know and, and be willing to share with people, right? Hey, Charlie, before we end, um, could you just talk just for a second? Because I see you have um, AA up here and NA up here. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, something that, that I think is really important for people to consider, too, people who are trying to help those that are addicted, is to um, know what, know what Al-Anon is and Alateen oh, yeah. is. Because sometimes mm -hmm. the frustration that you experience from trying to help someone um, who is very resistant 
um, is going to get you to a place where you start to feel like you're crazy. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, none of us want to, you know, start, you know, start using because, you know, we're so stressed out from trying to help somebody, you know, get their life back together. So I think that, um, you know, Al-Anon is just worth mentioning. Yeah, good point. Um, and you can speak more about it too. I've, I've never been involved in Al-Anon myself, but um, yeah. there are support groups out there for people who live with somebody who has a drug or alcohol problem. Um, and that's, you know, there's also some other groups that I think might be helpful. Like co uh, codependency groups are really good for this too. And I think Al-Anon covers a lot of that in their groups as well. But, you know, if you're struggling to, you know, to live with somebody, you know, uh, an adult, you know, a, a loved one, whether it's an intimate partner or a child that you've raised and now is addicted. Um, yeah, you should get support. And, you know, there's, I think Al-Anon, Al Alateen, is that for, for parents who are raising teenagers? Is that no, right? no, it's for teenagers who have parents that oh, are okay. alcoholics. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. Or a parent. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, there's support groups for pretty much everything nowadays. And the other thing that I would mention too, um, is we're finding more and more um, other kinds of alternative ways for people to either get support and or to quit. You know, there's a lot more um, online programs out there now mm -hmm. that are popping up and there's a lot of books written. There's just so much good information out there and so many different models for people to get help, whether they're trying to quit themselves or support somebody who's trying to quit um, that are really effective. We're finding those are an, another, a whole nother um, kind of milieu or medium that's reaching people and helping people to get support. So yeah, and now since COVID, you know, almost all the groups are are zoomed and online. Yeah. And I think they're finding, you know, people can attend more, they can participate more because they can just even be in their office on a lunch break and jump on a Zoom meeting. So um oh, I think yeah. that's going to take off and probably be a more popular approach. Of course, other, you know, hopefully once you know things settle, um, people always love getting together as well, of course. Yeah, but I agree. I think that, you know, COVID has really changed the, um, the you know, the setting, the, the, the number of options people have. And I, I do think that we're going to see more and more of that. So good. Thanks, Mary. All right. Well, I think our time is up. Anybody have any other quick questions before we finish up? I appreciate y'all coming. Thank, no, you, but thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Julie. Thank you, Charlie. That was really informative. Thank you so awesome. much. Thanks, Joyce.